Expertgruppen för biståndsanalys, EBA, är en statlig kommitté som oberoende analyserar och utvärderar svenskt internationellt bistånd för att det ska kunna förbättras och utvecklas. EBA har tio ledamöter med kompetenser från olika biståndsområden och ett kansli som verkställer besluten. Förutom våra rapporter så ordnar vi seminarier, workshops och möten mellan olika parter. Varje år sammanfattar EBA sin verksamhet i årsberättelsen Biståndsanalys. Den kan beställas från kansliet eller laddas ner på eba.se. EBA har ett oberoende i relation till uppdragsgivaren regeringen, liksom i relation till vad som utvärderas, samt till de rapportförfattare som anlitas. Rapportförfattarna ansvarar själva för slutsatser och rekommendationer i sina studier. Allt vi producerar som rapporter, seminarier och vår podcast EBA-podden finns tillgängligt på vår hemsida. Hello and good morning and welcome to this webinar where we will present a recent EBA study that analyzes Sweden's engagement in EU country programs and joint programming. Together with the panel, we will discuss the lessons learned and how they can inform future European cooperation in partner countries, from joint programming to Team Europe initiatives. My name is Magnus Lindell and I'm a member of the expert group and I will be moderating our discussion today. With me online, I have the author of the report, Eric Lundsgaard, who will present his finding in a moment. Uh, we have also four distinguished discussants and panelists. Uh, Ahmed Ismail from the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Annika Nordin Jayavarana from CEDA, Robert Backlund at the EU delegation in Nairobi, and Alexei Jones from ECDPM, a think tank on EU Africa relations. I will introduce all four of you a bit more properly later. But now let's turn to today's subject. For Sweden, the European Union represents a central platform for advancing foreign and development policy goals. Eric's study explores the relationship between Sweden and the European Union in development cooperation with a focus on programming at the part to country level. It analyzes Sweden's engagement in EU country programs and in joint programming against the backdrop of increased efforts to prioritize collaboration among the EU and member states. I will now invite Eric to make a brief presentation of his report. Eric Lundsgaard is an independent consultant based in Copenhagen. His work examines development policy agendas, the organization of development cooperation and development financing approaches. Now, Eric, over to you. Hello, everyone. Let me start by thanking the expert group for aid studies for supporting this research project and for providing an opportunity to present the key findings in this webinar today. My study covers several topics. It analyzes EU country and joint programming processes. It compares the development cooperation profiles of Sweden and the EU. It identifies avenues for EU member states to influence EU development cooperation. And it also reviews Swedish engagement in EU programming. The study examines the dynamics of EU member state relations at both headquarters level and in the field and presents evidence from five country cases, Bangladesh, Colombia, Georgia, Mali, and Uganda. In this overview, I'll focus first on the conclusions that relate to the status of EU joint programming efforts and then discuss conclusions dealing with Sweden's engagement with EU country level cooperation. EU joint programming has been around for more than a decade. It is one expression of efforts to improve collaboration between the EU institutions and the EU member states in development cooperation planning and implementation, and builds on earlier initiatives, including the Division of Labor Agenda. The EU conceives joint programming as a voluntary, flexible, and country-specific process it can take different forms depending on how EU delegations and member states organize and invest in joint programming in a given setting. The outputs from joint programming could also vary from place to place, but ideally outputs involve joint analysis and the formulation of a joint response. 
The joint response can include a framework for outlining how EU and member state financial contributions support a shared agenda and a common results measurement framework can be an additional output. The country cases vary in terms of how long joint programming has been on the agenda, what the process has involved, and how it has evolved over time. My general finding on joint programming, though, is that it has not led to a common implementation framework for the EU and member states in any of these places. While joint programming was still in its infancy in Colombia, in Bangladesh, Georgia, and Uganda, the process focused on joint analysis and the articulation of a joint vision or common political messages. The case of Mali stands out from the others in this study because its joint programming document serves as a basis for the EU's multi-annual indicative program in the country. Mali is considered a successful case of joint programming due to the well-structured cooperation process and the commitment to consolidated information collection, among other reasons. Even so, the joint programming output document there mainly presents a common vision and framework for action. It outlines common priorities and identifies which European donors are active across key thematic areas, but does not direct member state implementation choices. One positive aspect of joint programming to highlight across the countries is that it provides a platform for the EU and member states to learn more about their respective priorities as a basis for future collaboration but it can also be time intensive and may duplicate the efforts of the broader development partner forums to which the EU and member states contribute at country level. Broader coordination forums have similar information sharing and joint analysis functions. The study highlights several factors that limit the scope of EU joint programming coordination among the EU and its member states. First, Member states bring different sets of political and economic interests to their bilateral cooperation programs. This can shape their appetite for EU-centric coordination. Member states can also vary in their administrative systems for aid management. Member state country offices do not have the same flexibility to reorient priorities at country level in light of variations in the decision-making authorities delegated to the field. In a similar way, there can also be different interpretations and EU delegations on the flexibility that the EU has at country level to respond to member state input, potentially limiting how member state preferences are integrated in a collective process. Member state programs can also be constrained by nationally determined planning cycles, leaving them with different time horizons for the allocation of financial resources. And the human resources of country missions are a final constraint. Participation in EU coordination is a task that has to be balanced with other demands, such as program management and reporting to headquarters, and resources often are not specifically reserved for coordination efforts. The mixed record of joint programming provides relevant background for reflections on how Sweden can improve its country-level engagement with EU development cooperation. Swedish country strategies are short, and they focus on outlining thematic priorities but they typically contain a sentence that indicates that Sweden should play an active role in EU joint programming to support improved donor coordination. This is an indication that joint programming has been a strategic focus in framing Sweden's interaction with the EU at the country level. The study notes that country offices adhere to this guidance and adopt a supportive attitude toward EU coordination. But the study also indicates that the focus on joint programming and country strategies presents a narrow view of how Sweden engages with the EU at country level. So clarifying the different ways that Sweden and other member states bilateral programs interact with the EU at country level can be useful in identifying how to advance efforts to increase EU development effectiveness. Here's an overview of these different ways that the EU and member states interact. Joint programming emphasizes the coordination role of the EU in relation to member states with respect to development cooperation activities. Although joint programming can potentially encompass a more comprehensive agenda, the case studies in this analysis did not demonstrate this. For example, the joint programming strategy in Mali was informed by EU and member state stabilization activities, but covers only development funding. Due in part to the scale of its funding and the nature of the aid modalities that the EU uses, the EU often also plays an important role in leading dialogue with partner governments. 
political coordination with member states is relevant for the preparation of common positions and the ability to advocate on key foreign policy issues. Beyond these coordination roles, the EU manages development cooperation funding of its own and can be a relevant partner for member states as a co-financer for projects reflecting important bilateral priorities. For Sweden, this is particularly true on issues such as gender equality and climate action, where the EU and Sweden both have a strong profile. Another avenue for interaction between EU and country level administrations relates to the role of member state agencies as implementers of EU cooperation. And finally, even without actively coordinating with the EU, member states can engage with EU policy agendas by considering how their priorities align with those of the EU institutions and making the complementary character of funding priorities explicit. By considering these different avenues for interaction or engagement, Sweden and other member states can potentially identify specific building blocks for enhancing EU member state collaboration at country level that are not dependent on the momentum of a given joint programming process. Case studies suggest that there are several challenges that limit Sweden's abilities to engage with the EU at country level. One challenge relates to the qualities of the EU as a country level actor. Member state representatives note that the extent of consultations on EU programs varies. Uh, one explanation for this is that EU delegations are expected to consult with a wide variety of stakeholders at country level, partner governments, civil society, the private sector and local governments, for example. They're also constrained by guidance and schedules determined in Brussels. In a similar way, the EU is not the only game in town for Sweden. Although the EU is regarded as Sweden's central foreign policy platform and headquarters level, at country level, Sweden has other longstanding relationships with the World Bank and UN organizations, for example. These organizations are implementation partners and offer alternatives in areas such as leadership and coordination and joint implementation. As another example, partnerships with UN agencies may sometimes be considered a more important avenue for dialogue with the government than EU-centered dialogue. Third, Sweden has more limited experiences with the implementation of EU-delegated cooperation than other major member states like Germany, France, Belgium, and Spain. This is linked to Sweden's limited independent implementation capacities. And finally, the study notes that human resource considerations are also important in understanding Sweden's ability to engage effectively with the EU, both in terms of the availability of staff to perform coordination functions and the knowledge that it possesses about the EU development system. To conclude, let me highlight a few main areas for reflection for Sweden as it considers how to engage with the EU at the country level in the future. First, uh, the study points to potential for clarification on the priority that uh, alignment with the EU and strengthening EU coordination has in relation to other activities on the ground. Country strategies and the results reports that provide assessments of what country programs are achieving can clarify whether strengthening ties with the EU is a key goal in its own right, rather than forming part of the context of the implementation of thematic priorities, for example. Second, there's a need for further reflection on staffing and training needs to ensure that country offices have personnel available to promote collaboration with the EU and a familiarity with EU policies and approaches. And so as I understand, there's already been an evolution at headquarters uh, level to strengthen EU relevant expertise in the development administration. There's a question of how those changes provide a foundation for adaptations at the country level. And finally, and at the risk of stating the obvious, my last conclusion is that Sweden cannot fix the challenges in EU member state cooperation on its own uh, and outreach with other member states to address underlying cooperation challenges, such as the persistence of diverse national planning cycles is important in supporting the strengthening of the system. Thank you very much, Eric, for taking us through the highlights of, of your report. And, and those of you in the audience who want to read the full report can, of course, download it from Airbus website. Um, I will now invite our first discussant, uh, Ahmed Ismail, uh, to comment on Eric's report. Uh, Ahmed is um, desk officer at the Department for International Development Corporation at the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. 
He is responsible for EU external action instrument Global Europe, as well as Team Europe initiatives, which is the, the EU's new concept for increased coherence and cooperation between the EU and member states. Uh, Ahmed, the digital floor is yours. Thank you, Magnus, and uh, thanks a lot to Iba for inviting me and uh, letting me comment on this interesting report. Um, from my perspective, working on EU programming and EU development policy, uh, we are, of course, very happy always to have uh, focus and, and engagement towards um, EU development cooperation. And that will be important, not least in view of our upcoming EU presidency. Um, so. First, I'd like to, to highlight uh, that uh, the, the content and the conclusions that, that, that the report are, is making is, is based on the, the conditions that, that existed uh, during the last uh, multi-annual uh, multi uh, financial framework, uh, the MFF, um, and the current MFF for the period 2021 to 2027 has quite drastically entailed uh, changes into the conditions for in EU's development cooperation, both sort of from an instrumental but also methodological perspective. Uh, and at the same time, Swedish development cooperation strategies have, have also been revised. So, so although the report, but although the report analyzed a context that has um, changed uh, quite significantly compared to, to today's setting, uh, I think there are many uh, important uh, lessons to be learned from, from what we're now trying to, to do from the MFA and, and the, the Swedish uh, the team uh, that includes SIDA, SWED Fund and other actors when it comes to, to engagement with, with uh, the EU. Um, uh, but I'm happy, so I'm I'd like just to first to, to say that I'm ha very happy to note that the importance of, of engagement and dialogue between member states is emphasized between the member states and also with the EU is, is emphasized by the report, uh, both so, sort of to, to strengthen common priorities and, and from a complementarity perspective. I think that is really the essence of what we, what we now ha have since a few years uh, that is called the Team Europe approach that we from, from the Swedish MFA together with CEDA uh, and others are very much uh, engaged with and also are focusing on to be an active Team Europe member in our, in our um, uh, partner countries. Um, so going forward, I, uh, besides our own programming, I think that that EU's country programming will be the, the main am avenue to which we will provide uh, input in bilateral sec settings, but where joint programming uh, will be uh, considered when conditions are ripe to take on such a process. Because as we heard from Eric and from, we can see in the report, context really matters a lot. Um, the, the five cases shows that us in, in the report, they show really that local situations, both sort of from an internal Team Europe perspective, but also external factors uh, with, with um, both political settings and, and others uh, sets the conditions for programming and including also possibilities for joint programming. But also, uh, I would say informal coordination uh, in, in general. Um, so. I'm happy that that Mali is brought up as an example because it's it is um, uh, it is interesting to delve into more when it comes to joint programming because it's the it's one of the the cases we also are are constantly highlighting uh, internally to to showcase how coordination can 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 be be tackled but also sort of uh, go into more formal programming uh, process uh, with with regards to joint programming. And it, as we, we heard, it has been quite uh, well developed there, uh, relatively speaking. Um, and it is an in interesting study to, uh, to, to, to look into as well, an like interesting case to look into as well because of the, the, the setting itself, the context, because it's a fragile setting, um, which we see in many of our, uh, of our partner countries is increasingly the case. Therefore, I think it can influence also the, the way we do our work in many other, other settings. However, I mean, we, we, as we also heard, it, Mali has been somewhat of an outlier, uh, and that is uh, that is uh, what we can learn from the report as well. So then, therefore, it is important that we reflect a little bit upon how has joint programming developed since its inception. And I mean, I think we can be perfectly 
blunt and say it has been mixed mixed records uh, with it in terms of its achievement. However, I, I and and that is a, that can form a knowledge base for us when we now looking into the the current uh, situation with the the the, the political and uh, modality wise uh, conditions that are set in the new MFF when we are going forward how can it influence our 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 work and i'd like to just sort of first take the the the, the issue of of programming where we from the MFA together with 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 all team sweden members if i can call them that are trying to do our part in terms of of programming for for global europe the new uh, the new uh, financial instrument of the eu uh, since uh, a year and a half and I and <clears throat> I mean, uh, we focus on our bilateral uh, partner countries in, in that process, and we come in through formally through comitology, as uh, the Commission has been delegated the, the 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 autonomy to 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 program basically. So I mean, our our role formally is through comitology, uh, and indeed it is important for us to to be part of formal processes and settings. But when we come as a member state come in in in, in the committee stage uh, it is a quite late stage so in practical terms the margins for us to influence uh, and also to to understand what the eu will do to in, be able to complement our own on own, own actions it, it's quite limited therefore i think it's important to emphasize the informal dialogues and, and processes and uh, exchanges that we that that we have in the field with our colleagues from, from on the EU side, but also on an HQ level. Uh, but as programming, both nationally uh, from from a Swedish point of view, but also from the EU, it takes place in the field. I think it's it's that is where sort of the the magic happens, and that is why we are constantly emphasizing from the MFA that uh, that um, we should be an active part um, uh, in, with with in terms of of um, uh, of informal dialogue, so I, so I I think we 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 need to 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 have an exchange with with the, our colleagues both from member states and the EU uh, uh, constantly, and that is what we're emphasizing all all the time, both taking part in formal processes but also informal processes. So I mindful of time, I just like to sort of end by saying that. One important factor going ahead is that we we are very much now looking into the Team Europe initiatives and TIs, and uh, we have a we have a great political buy-in uh, from that uh, from Sweden and also from from the rest of the EU. And CEDA is really engaged uh, in that we uh, as well, and we think that. TIs hopefully and possibly can fill the, the 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 void that maybe joint programming has a little bit not not been able to 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 achieve, and be a sort of an, a precursor when when feasible to uh, joint programming. So uh, and I hope what is important uh, from from our perspective going ahead is that TIs are being uh, developed sort of with an external vista and having having an being an inclusive uh, process that looks both sort of inclusive internally in the team europe setting but also that we are taking in uh, to consideration um, local ownership issues and and taking into the, to the context that we are uh, that we uh, that we are in uh, much into account and that is i'm very hopeful for that because from the commission side and the eu side ti's are being very sort of focused, uh, being very uh, large emphasis on on flexibility. Uh, so I, I hope that we will, as EU development pa partners, can actually bring uh, bring better impact and and be better effectiveness uh, going ahead with having more tools to our disposal uh, when with uh, Team Europe initiatives in addition to joint pro programming. Uh, because that will be very important when when we're being sort of scrutinized in 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 the coming years to to what we have devel delivered on uh, as sort of development promises to to, to our partner countries. So uh, I'd, uh, I'll end there and just say thanks once again for inviting me and also for the report which will um, uh, and for the continued discussions on on EU uh, development cooperation ahead.
thank you very much, Ahmed, and, and thank you for setting the report in, in a wider context. Uh, we will drill down a bit deeper into the concept of Team Europe initiatives, uh, which you mentioned later in this webinar. But just a short follow-up question before we move on. Um, you, you indicated uh, that there could be a stronger focus on Team Europe in, in Sweden's country strategies. Could you even envisage taking a step further and actually aligning strategies more with, with uh, other member states? After all, that would really increase the prospects for real country uh, collaboration. Could you give a brief, a brief answer to, to a very wide question? I'll try my best. Uh, I mean, the devil is always in the details, to be honest. Uh, but but uh, first of all, I th I'd just like to say that I think the, in in recent years we have we have uh, from from Swedish point of view we have a bit more emphasized uh, the importance of of EU and Team Europe in our national strategies, which also I hope caters for for better cooperation uh, coherence that, on the issues that the report is highlighting. Um, because um, but then sort of back to your specific question and on aligning uh, national strategies, ultimately, of course, it's up to the political leadership uh, whether or not they, they would, would like us to, to do such a thing. Uh, but I think also strategies are not, not formulated in a political void. So I think, you know, how other the donors are, are focusing, uh, including the EU, uh, is of course ultimately very much influencing how we formulate our strategies in, together with with our policy, the, the national policy perspectives. Um, so I mean, if there's a political will, a clear gain to be made, and possibility to align, I say, why not? Swedish perspective is that we should aim to be effective, and I think the principles for effective development cooperation. Uh, clearly guides us as donors to pursue alignments for many reasons. However, I just need to sort of say, say that I'm not sure that it's uh, what, what you're aiming at is not solely about uh, an issue about aligning strategies, to be frank. Uh, many times I think we can find common ground in sort of Team Europe towards co uh, policy priorities today already. Uh, um, I think as the report is indicating working methods, methods and also resources are, one, are important factors uh, that we need to take into account. And if I just sort of uh, briefly can, can take one example of how we're now working, I think we have one TI uh, on a regional TI on sexual, um, on SRHR in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we see 10 member states joining forces to tackle that issue from a regional point of view. Of, obviously, we have 10 member states that have the same sort of policy priorities in their national strategies to work on that issue. So I, I'm not certain that we that, that policy alignment is solely the, 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 what we need to, to focus on. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, uh, now, uh, it's, uh, I want to move over to Annika Nordin Jayavardena, who will provide us with a in country perspective, Annika is presently coordinator for the hub for agency cooperation at CEDA headquarters, uh, but she has a long history in development cooperation, having worked for CEDA multilateral and, and civil society. She has been the head of development cooperation in Swedish embassies in Kenya, Ethiopia and Armenia. So she brings to this discussion an extensive experience from bilateral cooperation at the country level. Now, Annika, we are looking forward to hearing your reflections. Over to you. I wish to thank uh, Erik Lundsgarde uh, and Eba and also Ahmed's uh, uh, presentation here. I want to thank Ahmed for that. Uh, uh, and thank you for asking me to come with some comments. And I was supposed to give a field perspective. Uh, as it's not so long ago that I came back from Ethiopia and then also Armenia and Kenya is about 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, if I look at the report, uh, I think it, uh, it uh, clearly shows um, in the analysis, analysis uh, and in the conclusions on the case studies that staff from Swedish embassies are keen on coordination. And that's my feeling as well, and coordination within EU and with EU. And we are keen on moving towards joint reporting, joint analysis of results, um, and what the port is really giving high marks to the Swedish staff involved in bilateral co 
inspiration. And uh, I have observed this among my staff and in my own work, uh, I've been also very much involved with this. Um, and uh, the report shows that Swedes, Swedish embassies with CEDA staff set aside time for regular meetings with the EU delegation and its member states. And um, the regularity is a condition for development of joint programming and joint country programs with meaningful consultations. And, um, and it's also uh, important for, for the new Team Europe initiative so to succeed. Um, and I, as I said, I've been involved in joint coordination with the EU delegation in Kenya 2003 to 2011, Ethiopia from 16 to 21, and Armenia in 2022. And my first hand experience is that EU and member states have so far achieved some information sharing. And I think that is the focus also in the TEIs now some coordination and well as some joint visibility. In some cases, also joint follow-up and joint programming. Um, but my experience is that the joint programming is much better experienced in the sector working groups that are part part of the overall donor coordination. The coordination where multilaterals and bilaterals are also involved and where there is often uh, leadership from government in those sector working groups and uh, in the overall uh, development coordination. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is a point that I would like to, to raise. And uh, I would also, I've also seen that sometimes EU ignores the overall development cooperation. And I've seen that when we started focusing more on the overall coordination and get the working groups to function better and did better political analysis together, uh, then the real coordination took place in those sector working groups. And there were good dialogue that uh, could be carried out in those as well. Uh, so uh, I would put that on the table for the future to see how we can look at the overall development cooperation, which is wider than EU. And I'll come back to what, what is then EU's role and the member states. Uh, something else that I observed and that I have me met in my earlier work as well uh, is that Many member states have recently cut funding and have less funding in development cooperation. And accordingly, they also have lack of staff. Uh, and, and due to the lack of staff, they have less time and ability for regular information sharing, which I said is, is, a, is needed in order to get somewhere in, in joint programming and TEIs. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, that hampers effective aid effectiveness, which is what we are talking about. It's also so that the EU delegations are sometimes very understaffed in relation to the, the big portfolio that they have, uh, and also lack time to coordinate joint efforts. And um, we have also seen that Sweden can be understaffed. Um, yeah, from this report, uh, um, let me also say something on which uh, Ahmed also talked about on the political and economic context. I think uh, in uh, uh, Ethiopia, we developed uh, a very good analysis together. And we did it by while the youth were demonstrating outside practically. And, uh, and they were asking for democracy and human rights. And together we de developed a very good joint program to work on democracy and human rights, governance, resilience, and also economic recovery, uh, as well as environment and climate change. But those were not the big priorities in Ethiopia at that time. And it was not so easy to have dialogue on those issues. Uh, 
So our joint program never started. But uh, what happened with it, it was that it influenced this new Swedish strategy from 2016 to 2020. Uh, and it influenced many other strategies of the member states. Um, and when it became easier after 2018 in Ethiopia to work on these issues, it also influenced uh, and the analysis, analysis was useful for the overall uh, development cooperation. So to just conclude, uh, I take with me from this report and my experience in, in those three countries um, that the analysis is very important and it can influence the overall development for us. Uh, we need to base interventions uh, on what's already going on in development cooperation, not think of EU as something separate. And we need to build on structures that already exist, um, such as, for example, sector working groups. The importance uh, of political economy analysis, conflict analysis, and, and that for EU to work jointly with their political side and their development side, I think we have come much further than EU on that in the Swedish embassies. We are working much closer on politics and development. Uh, and EU should not just focus on what the EU delegation and member states are doing. Uh, they could try to influence the wider development uh, partner uh, working, um, development partner mechanisms to work together with both multilaterals and bilaterals and we could have a joint voice on democracy and human rights which we had in a sense in 2018 in ethiopia as an example but um but it's more important to work on that sometimes it's difficult i find to get a tei that works on democracy and human rights i still haven't seen one it's more on digital digitalization SMEs and those things are easier to get through in TEIs. Um, some on environment and climate change, I guess they are slowly coming, but very few on democracy and human rights and governance. And, and, and that's something that could be encouraged. Uh, so uh, to, uh, uh, to conclude, I think we need to see the agenda 2030 and we need to see that uh, for aid effectiveness, it's not only EU, but it is EU and all the other actors in that country, and it's the private sector and it's civil society. Uh, and uh, we need to build mechanisms to consult with them. Uh, and we need to see how we can have joint coordination and dialogue uh, within the, the whole donor community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annika. Um, just a, a very quick follow up. You mentioned uh, some of the challenges, sh challenges facing joint programming in, in Ethiopia. From your perspective, what could have been done differently to, to, to counter that? Uh, just a one minute answer, Annika, if you can. Yeah. Uh, I think I agree with Ahmed with context. Uh, there have been so many EU Brussels directives and, and, and we didn't really have have a context analysis on that actually there was mechanisms for coordination already in the country and in those sector working groups many eu member states we were i think 12 member states um, and there were 28 development partners all together uh, but we actually had a lot of cooperation in social protection agriculture health education water and we could have built on those and then we would have got joint programming in those areas as a small part of the, of the total sector working group. And we could have pushed for issues like to integrate a conflict perspective, a rights-based approach, democracy, human rights. Um, I also think that uh, we could have been more sensitive to the polit economic political context, more cooperation between the political and um, development side in the EU. And, uh, uh, by doing so, I think we, we could probably have got some joint programming going and learning by doing rather than think the big joint perfect program. However, as I said, we did have some unintended results. It, it uh, affected 
Uh, it affected the new EU strategy. It affected many development partner strategies and our own strategy, uh, the work that we did, but we didn't get joint programs. Thank, thank you, Annika. Um, I will now move over to our second country perspective, which will come from Robert Backlund, um, but from a slightly different corner. Uh, Robert is Team Europe Councillor at the EU delegation in Nairobi. He's leading the Team Europe approach uh, at the delegation with two uh, Team Europe initiatives. Uh, and Robert has previously worked at the Swedish MFA, SIDA and Swedish embassies in Mozambique, Liberia and Kosovo. Robert, uh, we are eager to hear your perspective. Over to you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me and for this very interesting discussion. Well, firstly, I, I think it's we have to go more to the bottom to why should we at all have a Team Europe approach. Uh, notably, the EU today is a bit pressed uh, from what is happening around us in the world, what is happening around uh, with, with Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, what's happening in relation to China. Uh, and, and nowadays we have a, 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 a good administration in the US, but, but not too long ago, we, we had a Trump administration, which was more difficult to handle. So I think this is the context you should understand the EU, that the EU stands for values that are threatened. And uh, what Team Europe is doing is that instead of presenting the different member states in a fragmented way, what each and every individual member state is doing. It can present the totality of what the EU stands for. So, so in that sense, I, I think we should keep in mind that the EU is a very powerful tool that can be an actor on the global arena in a way that hardly or basically no individual EU member state can be. So this is the start. Then uh, I would also like to uh sorry a comment on uh, what annika said on on how do you organize this actually in practice with, with, with the member states and, and the government i think it's a good point that the joint sector working groups is very could be a very useful concept to, to continue working in uh, and it can actually be, be devastating to start spoiling them if they're up and running already because now, if we know who we are and what we stand for, we can still uh, take a, a, a leadership in areas that are prioritized for, for, for the EU. And that is, I, I think, a little bit what, what Annika is, is saying. Um, and also to, to what Ahmed was saying, uh, with the EU, uh, we have to understand the comitology uh, but the comatology is, firstly, it's, it's quite complex and difficult to understand and very different from any other creature that we, we know since before. But it's, it's certainly not enough because basically everything in the EU is decided in an informal way with, with a lot of informal meetings and networking and social. You got to know the people, you got to plant it well in advance. But usually the best way of influencing the EU if you really want something to happen on the ground, is for, for, for a member state to take, take a leadership and, and show that they are ready to invest time, to invest expertise in, in, uh, in uh, these jointly agreed areas. Now, this is happening to still to a very little extent. Uh, I have some, some examples of, of where it's actually working. Here in Kenya, we, we see that Germany has stepped forward. Uh, the, uh, they have worked for, for a number of years with a sector-wide approach in, in TVET, where they invite other EU member states and the EU delegation to take advantage of that. Germany also take a full lead in the area of digitalization. Uh, so, so we're very thankful to, to that. But perhaps my, my last point at this point in time is that uh, when we look at the EU, uh, we, we should not think of it as development cooperation per se or, or only. The EU is working with development. The EU is working with political relations. The EU is using uh, areas like trade and investment 
for the benefit of a good political relation and development. So in order to understand how we can work with the EU, we need to like embrace the, the full concept of the EU and not limit ourselves to, to, to what possibly more narrow, narrowly can be called uh, development cooperation, knowing how trade and investment also contribute to the, to the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, uh, and thank you for introducing a, a, a wider perspective, a sort of geostrategic uh, perspective into this discussion and, and the concept of, of Team Europe, um, uh, taking that a bit further. And that actually uh, gives me pleasure then to introduce our final panelist, uh, uh, which will um, uh, expand on that perspective a bit further, Alexei Jones. Alexei is a senior policy officer and head of the EU foreign and development policy work stream at ECDPM, a think tank specialized in EU Africa relations. Um, Alexei's work covers EU development cooperation policies, programs, and financing instruments. And he has recently published on good global Europe programming and the implementation of team Europe initiatives. So Alexei, you have, you are now the the final uh, panelist in this on this segment of the of the webinar. Over to you, Alexei. Thanks, uh, Magnus, and uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for for the invitation and this very uh, fruitful discussion so far and the report, which uh, which uh, I read with with great interest. And uh, Magnus, you you had uh, asked me to to maybe not focus so much on on the report itself, the findings, but maybe to bring some some kind of forward looking uh, and linking uh, the discussion on joint programming to uh, the big name of the game uh, at the moment uh, is the Team Europe approach, Team Europe initiatives. And maybe I'm not sure to what extent our audience is, is familiar with, with the concept of Team Europe or Team Europe initiatives. So maybe just before I begin, just explaining that this is indeed a new concept that emerged uh, yeah, two, two years ago, a bit more than two years ago in the context of the, the EU response to the, the COVID um, pandemic to show what the EU together with the member states and new players, and this is a, an important dimension, new players, the, the, the DFIs, the development finance institutions, banks, so really the whole European development community at large could do to support partner countries in addressing the, the consequences and the impact of the, of the COVID. And it, it has indeed uh, gained a lot of traction, a lot of political buy-in, uh, the Team Europe approach, um, in so far that it actually is now being promoted as a new branding of EU collective work in the area of development cooperation and has been now transformed into or applied into also showcasing what the EU and member states can do together through so-called Team Europe initiatives, which basically are big flagship initiatives bringing together activities of the EU, of member states, implementing agencies, but also banks, and, and trying to bring that together in, in a coherent narrative focused around, I would say, five key core priorities, political priorities that the EU and member states have agreed uh, in the context of the, of the multi-annual financial framework, which revolve around climate, digital, growth and jobs, migration, <clears throat> Uh, peace, uh, governance. Uh, so all key, I would say, geopolitical priorities for the EU. And the aim is really to bring together the EU collective uh, firepower around these, these initiatives. And they have, been, have now indeed been center stage of the EU programming exercise. And, and in a way, the link uh, here with the joint programming and working better together is, is, quite, uh, is quite smooth. And, and clearly there, are, there, are, there is a continuation between what the EU has trying, been trying to promote in the past decade or so when it comes to joint programming and those team Europe initiatives. Um, and at this stage, there are three um, essential, I think, challenges moving forwards in implementing the Team Europe initiatives and making the linkages with 
what existed, what pre-existed already in terms of working better together, joint programming. I think the first point, uh, first challenge is actually maintaining the momentum that was created with, with Team Europe. Uh, I mentioned earlier that indeed there had been a lot of political buy-in because Team Europe approach emerged in a context, uh, the battle of narratives that uh, that emerged in the, in, uh, in the COVID um, uh, pandemic uh, and, and what the EU had to face when it came to showing that indeed it was supporting its partner countries in the same way that China or Russia were also communicating strongly about what they were doing on their side. So it really galvanized and made it very necessary, uh, vital almost for the EU to respond to that, uh, to show that it was also active. And, and I think this, this new rationale of why we should communicate better, show and be more visible about what the EU and the member states and I said the broader European development family can do and communicate on, on how it supports. So that strong rationale has really um, you know, created a new momentum for the EU and member states working together. And I think nothing is gained. I think that the two years uh, into the Team Europe, we're still quite high uh, when it comes to that momentum. But there's there's never there's always a risk that it dies down, it dies out, um, and I think that the key challenge is indeed to maintain that momentum and avoid what uh, the joint programming suffered in the past few years, which is a certain fatigue, fatigue because it was seen indeed as a quite a, a cumbersome bureaucratic exercise uh, which took time. Um, and, and I think a lot of, of people, even the most motivated, and I think uh, Sweden was, was indeed among those member states the most committed and dedicated, but I think indeed we hear a lot that it was quite draining in terms of resources, in terms of the, the length of the process. And, and what the Team Europe approach brought is, is much more flexible, ad hoc dynamic, which indeed uh, was very uh, was very uh, attractive uh, because it didn't entail a lot of preparatory work. Actually, Team Europe uh, was essentially bringing together what already was being made or planned. So there was no necessity to create and sit around the table and discuss and plan ahead. So that I think that's that new dynamic uh, is very positive and played in favor of the Team Europe approach and Team Europe initiatives, and that should be maintained somehow. And in order to do that, obviously, as we move towards the implementation of those Team Europe initiatives, I think more and more we need to seek the synergies, and that's the second challenge, I think, seek the synergies, the linkages between what pre-existed, the joint programming processes in different countries, uh, the working better together, the different ways of doing that, um, and, and, and this new, I would say, renewed approach around Team Europe initiative. I think there's now a, a real need to make sure that these two processes or approaches do not run in parallel, but on the contrary, merge somehow, at least seek the synergies between, between them. And it's true that in the past uh, couple of years, uh, a lot of the, the political uh, attention and effort was around the Team Europe approach, Team Europe initiatives. Uh, the, the Commission has put a lot of, of pressure also on the delegations in the context of the programming exercise to come up with those Team Europe initiatives and is doing a lot of you know, communication around, around them and linking also that to the global gateway, which is yet another branding. And at some point, there is a need indeed to make sure that all these different initiatives, uh, branding exercises link to each other and, and mutually reinforce each other. So definitely, there's not, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, they are mutually reinforcing somehow, but I think the linkages are not, are not quite clear. And that's the second challenge, I think, moving forward will be to make sure that ultimately Team Europe joint programming, joint implementation, or the working better together agenda is, is one and, and a coherent agenda. Uh, and I think uh, in doing that, um, obviously there are, there are rules, there is a framework to establish and, and the risk obviously, uh, whenever the, we talk about EU processes, the risk is that it becomes quite quickly a very bureaucratic technical exercise. And we see already some hints and some concerns uh, that uh, we, we need to find this, this balance between a very flexible ad hoc, very light approach uh, focusing a lot on, on communication, on branding, which was maybe what was missing uh, in the joint programming uh, process, uh, but that doesn't that doesn't um, die 
because of overburdening the boat. And we see that already the fine balance needs to be found between that. Uh, but obviously, if you want impact and results through Team Europe, you need to also establish some kind of common light, uh, but common framework and, and, and procedures. So for the EU and the member states, and I think this point uh, raised earlier that there's homework for everyone in that uh, the delegation, the, the sorry, the commission and the delegations in particular have that mandate to to bring together the, the and to coordinate the EU uh, and the member states uh, and to promote joint programming where possible. And just a reminder that this is this is a legal obligation for for the EU, the a treaty obligation even to to coordinate and and the commitment to to join programming is still quite high. I think legally speaking, but politically, I think a lot of the attention and focus has been on on Team Europe. So, bringing those two together is is a is a key is a key challenge. The last point I think moving forward, obviously, is when we bring together all these actors and try to make sense of these different processes, we must not forget that Team Europe Global Gateway Joint Programming doesn't make any difference for partner countries unless there's a real change, there's a real difference. So what really matters at the end of the day, obviously, are results, impact. And in order to do that, we must absolutely avoid that this remains a purely Eurocentric exercise and process. And I think until now, we have also heard that maybe rightly so, a lot of the emphasis has, has been in the past few years to try to get the European actors together, to buy into this Team Europe approach, linking this to the EU programming exercise, which has been quite a, a, a process which has been you know, done in, in a very short time so, um, and maybe has not uh, paid enough attention to engaging uh, with partner countries, involving partner countries, governments, local authorities, civil society, private sector. So there's a lot of work now, I think, to be done in order to reach out and make sure that partner countries and stakeholders are actively involved and even take ownership of that process. Because without country ownership, and this was mentioned already a few times this morning, um, there's no, there's no long-lasting and sustainable impact. So we cannot overemphasize, I think, here the importance of country ownership within those very EU-centered processes. Uh, and I think that's, that's a, a key point here. Uh, I will leave it at that, but more than happy to, to continue the discussion in, in, in the Q&A. Thank you, Alexei, and thank you for widening the perspective and, and highlighting something of some of the challenges we, we, uh, we will have moving forward. Now, before going further into the program, uh, I'd just like to give our audience a heads up that there is a chance to, to uh, comment or ask questions. You can do that by the Q&A function in Zoom. Just post your question and we will address uh, as many of them as we can uh, in a while. Um, I will now uh, kick off our panel discussion um, and um, I will first turn to you, uh, Robert. Um, Alexei mentioned the, the joint program fatigue um, and, and the Team Europe initiatives is sort of designed to address that fatigue um, partly. Um, fr from, from your perspective, um, um, what happens then with joint programming? Um, to team Europe initiatives are more flexible, more stakeholders, more focus, easier to manage uh, and, and everything. What happens with joint programming? Will it eventually die out? Um, uh, no, I, I don't think your programming will die out because I, I just think it's natural to collaborate when, when, when we have, whenever we have opportunity to, and that is, and, and I, I agree basically with, with, with everything that Alexei said. There is certainly a, a joint programming fatigue, but once once it's it's relevant, it's going to happen. I also agree that the Team Europe approach is much more flexible and light, so that gives us a little bit new energy into the system, energy that we, we badly need. And um, I, I think there is certainly much more opportunity to, to start aligning strategies both time-wise and content-wise, but also look at the widened perspective, as you have, have, have uh, mentioned too, uh, which includes not only the joint programming, but also the policy dialogue and communication 
and, and, and these uh, parts. But we need to acknowledge that we need to learn also about the, the geopolitical connotations to our development cooperation. It might be that we, we need to, to make it a little bit less voluntary and set up if not uh, obligatory processes. So at least a highlight a good, couple of good examples. And I know that Sweden, for instance, in, in, in the develop in the follow-up of development cooperation, CEDA has to, to account for how they collaborate in Team Europe, which I think is a, a great thing because it makes uh, CEDA think twice and, and learn from their experiences. And the last thing that I want, want to add uh, is uh, that I actually think that what we're doing right in this seminar, the, the cooperation between CEDA and MFA is, is worth highlighting because at 10 or 15 years ago, it was not so, so evident that CEDA and MFA should collaborate. Now, what, what we see happening nowadays is, is, is a very good example and it leads to how do we connect the dots between development cooperation and the rest of policy. And notably, this is what we would like to see more from the EU, uh, seeing that EEAS and INTPA not always speak the same language or are, 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 or are on the same page. So if there would be a way for how Sweden could highlight that during the, the presidency, it would be a beautiful thing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. I also would like to, to um, hear your perspective on this, Ahmed. Um, uh, how many marching orders can we have at the same time? Is the new marching order uh, more Team Europe initiatives and less joint programming? How, how much can we cope with uh, um, both at headquarters level and at the embassy level? Could you elaborate a bit on that? Well, thanks, uh, Magnus. Uh, I, I think that the marching order for a while has been that we want Sweden to be an active part, basically, in the, the, the processes, uh, the, the, the EU processes that, that are being developed locally. But it was a sort of from more of a Brussels or HQ uh, level point of view and make available of the possibilities that are being uh, brought forward to us, in, not least through the new MFF with, with uh, one uh, in, uh, external action instrument, Global Europe, but also the TEIs and the Team Europe approach that has actually been quite successful in bringing us together. So, I mean, what, what we're trying to emphasize all, uh, all the time from the MFA's perspective, and I know that CEDA is doing the same sort of also, is that make use of what we have available to that we can use as a as a tool for impact basically and a tool to 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 be um, to be uh, effective um in terms of bringing added value to our partners uh, uh, but that sort of does not mean that it's forming a dichotomy with 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 joint programming that we should focus only on ti's uh, if i sort of i was happy that alexei mentioned sort of the political legal perspectives i mean I yesterday was looking at our guidelines for strategies in Swedish development cooperation and it clearly states that joint programming is a possibility uh, and that Sweden has committed to participate and contribute to it. So I mean it has been for a while, long while and still is sort of explicitly mentioned in the strategy guidelines that we have that are forming sort of and influencing uh, how, how we develop our national strategies. So I think it's it's perfectly still valid. Um, however, I, uh, TIs is being now very much has a very large momentum and we are trying to do our part in that. So from from we're continuously trying to convey to our colleagues um, that are working in these processes that we should that they should feel empowered to 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 use them uh, and but that also means also that we that you give and take a bit sort of uh, we lose a little bit of autonomy may perhaps uh, but we gain a lot uh, from it as well uh, as I think was was perfectly showcased by by Annika from 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 uh, her experiences um but but it is really important that is in the ti's for example is a very inclusive and participatory process um uh, that that also brings in the local perspectives i think and i think one thing i just um uh, concludingly would like to to emphasize is what robert also mentioned during his intervention was that you know we we that we are also trying to to emphasize to our colleagues is that we cannot sort of wait and see what 
what um, what uh, what the EU delegation will do and how the Commission or what someone else will sort of do the work. Uh, it is you you can and you should feel empowered to be forward leaning uh, in terms of how we, how we're uh, engaging with with TIs. And there there is a possibility the the flexible modalities that are available to us. In, uh, allow us to do that and and i think that is uh, very important to, to 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 use and i think it's it it also will uh, is encouraged from from um, the the members um, the commission as well that we as member states can take that role and i think we can play a very important role to ensure that principle for effective development cooperation is is in uh, is is uh, is there local ownership um, and, and sort of principled approach in many ways. Um, thank you, Ahmed. Um, Annika, very briefly, um, you gave testimony, testimony to this uh, joint program fatigue, uh, uh, at least in a way. Um, uh, isn't, um, I mean, the Team Europe initiatives being more flexible with a lighter touch um that should sounds like a blessing when you're working in a understaffed uh, embassy yes i think yeah. i mean my experience from ethiopia and armenia is that the T tis really uh gave energy and it was very easy it was like a mapping exercise sort of we decided some areas or some geographic areas where we would work together or some thematic areas and, and we mapped it together, and then we could give visibility on that. It was very easy with the COVID. I think we had a lot of energy then. That was then I was in Ethiopia, then I was in Armenia when we decided a geographical area uh, close to a conflict area. And, uh, and it also gave energy and we managed to get it together. But, but you know there is also this whole issue of the results framework that we are supposed to report against how are we going to get that to work and uh, of course in armenia there were no overall uh, development cooperation so i cannot talk about that but in ethiopia there is a very well established mechanism for heads of agencies to meet and for the sector working groups and i do think that we need to look at what is already going on uh, and be even more uh, concrete and context specific to make this work this time. Uh, it's good that we have energy, visibility, mapping, we have a results framework that we can report on, but, but the real results, and uh, as someone was saying here that, uh, you know, it, it, there is a more consultation to be done and, and alignment to government uh, plans, uh, to see where is the leadership, who are the drivers of change, uh, civil society's role, what can the private sector do? We know that it cannot only be development cooperation for change. There is also the need for the private sector and there is the need for civil society, for lobbying, but also for some, some uh, real work on the ground uh, to uh, make sure that there are results for, for the most vulnerable. Thank so you. it's uh, so so I think that there are challenges around this and I think we need to take them on and uh, we need to continue to see TEI also in relation to to government plans and to the overall development cooperation where where that exists. Thank you Annika. Um, it will very soon be time to let in some of the questions from the audience but before we do that I would like to turn to you Alexei. <laughs> Um, you mentioned the wider geopolitical uh, arena uh, and, and that some Team Europe and Team Europe initiatives must be seen with that background. Um, so a direct question to you, um, is the geopolitical perspective becoming perhaps even the most important one in EU country engagement? What would you say? I would say yes, definitely. I think uh, development cooperation nowadays um, has arguably uh, become uh, essentially driven by geopolitical concerns. Um, obviously, we have uh, 
primary objective of poverty eradication, sustainable development. But if you look at the, the EU discourse uh, lately, and even, I mean, it's a much more interest driven uh, agenda. Uh, and that partly was also what we, what we needed. What the EU needed was to make sure that development cooperation was not detached and was uh, clearly linked to broader foreign EU foreign policy interests. Uh, and obviously the two uh, must must complement and work together. So and that's the whole the whole rationale, the whole raison d'etre also of the new approach of the EU, the global Europe instrument, which brings together development cooperation instruments and, and policy objectives with with other linked to the neighborhood, security, uh, and, and just more generally, the, the much more um, interest driven co development cooperation. So I think and in that context, one of the interests precisely is linked to the geopolitical environment where the EU stands. And I think uh, this, is, this is to be welcome, that uh, obviously development cooperation is also linked to broader foreign policy interests and objectives, but there's, there's obviously a risk. And I think the risk uh, is, is that uh, we are driven too, too far away from um, development, uh, core development cooperation objectives or principles for that matter. I heard uh, quite a few times this morning reference to development effectiveness uh, principles, uh, which, which I, I, I feel are a bit missing nowadays in the overall policy discourse of the EU. So I think, yes, there's a, there's a much stronger uh, geopolitical rationale uh, and, and narrative behind uh, development cooperation or EU international cooperation. Uh, arguably, even the word development is now becoming a taboo has been removed from uh, from the name of the of the commissioner in charge for international partnerships now so i think yes that there's a clear trend um and and probably that's also why there has been such a uh, I think a wake-up call uh, to which everyone has has responded positively when it comes to to okay in order to respond and reposition uh, Europe or the EU collectively on the global scene we must we must absolutely work and do things together and I think that's the whole that's the whole story behind behind Team Europe. Um, thank you very much, Alexei. Um, I will now um, let in the first question from. Our audience and I think uh, Eric you will be the first one on this one and then perhaps it will trigger reflections from the rest of the panel. Uh, the question is the following, the role of the partner country was not mentioned during the presentation. Uh, shouldn't they have the leading role in coordinating development partners and couldn't EU joint programming potentially undermine such efforts? I think uh, Annika touched briefly on this but uh, Eric uh, can you reflect for a minute or two? Yeah, thank you for the question. And I think um, to some extent, this, uh, this question has already been reflected in, in Alexei's remarks as well um, in, in characterizing the joint programming process as a Eurocentric um, in initiative. Uh, from the case studies that I uh, reviewed, uh, there wasn't a lot of evidence that the, there, there was demand from the partner government side um, for a, a European specific um, coordination process or high level of engagement of uh, partner governments in the process. So in, indeed, you know, looking at, at Annika's suggestion of how to consider um, how these European coordination initiatives fit within a broader uh, development coordination uh, setting where uh, governments may be more invested, but, you know, even with the sector working groups or um, more general coordination structures, partner governments aren't always um, that enthusiastic about coordinating. Uh, there might be opportunities to strengthen the, the partner level engagement uh, by considering how these European processes fit with uh, the broader uh, donor coordination structures. But it is a, um, it is a, a trade-off on the one hand, uh, trying to uh, strengthen the ties between uh, European partners that can produce uh, some kinds of efficiency gains, increase visibility, promote European uh, policy goals, um, while trying also to accommodate the, um, the, the interests of the partner uh, governments. Uh, thank you, Eric. I guess, Robert, um, that this is a problem you are struggling with um, from, from your perspective in your role in Nairobi. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, of course, we want to, to have as, as much leadership from the 
Kenyan government as possible. Uh, I, I think the, the best days of do donor coordination was during the, the uh, general budget support era, where, where the government had a very clear stake in what they wanted from, from donors. Uh, this is only my, my, my personal perception that since budget support has become much less uh, present, the, the, the government's interest for allocating resources. We think it's burdensome for ourselves to, to, to do all this coordination. It's burdensome for the government too, that they, we ask them to allocate people to do all this uh, in all the different sectors. So what we do is to, to, that we work uh, with, uh, uh, we read the government's policies, we have dialogues, we talk to them on technical level, on political level, as much as possible. But in the end, uh, it's uh, we know how many details it, we can go down to, and we can't really push all that to the government either. Uh, it's my, my my short response to that, and I don't know if I can just uh, comment very briefly to to Alexei at the same time. If we're dreaming too far away from the from the development objectives, I would not certain. I would not really agree to that. Uh, I would rather say that. Uh, we have instruments, as, as we said, that, that are not directly ODA-driven instruments, let's say private sector uh, investments and so on. And also in university exchanges, in civil society exchanges, there are just a number of areas and we, we love to see that, but everything does not have to be driven by ODA. So the broader and deeper partnerships we can see in many different levels, the better it is. And then ODA obviously has a role to catalyze that uh, at, at times. But, but this is what, what I would call a, a real development is, is when ODA is no longer at the core. Thank you, Robert. Um, I would like Annika to let you in on this issue of, of ownership. Um, uh, can you have, a, do you have any brief reflection on that? Uh, yes, uh, I'll, I'll start by uh, what uh, Robert was saying, that it was easier to coordinate development partners and it was also easier for the government to coordinate us when we had budget support. Now, EU still have budget support in, in more, many countries, uh, so one could start looking at that instrument. But on the other side, I have had a good experience from uh, Kenya, where we work to develop together with the government, together with the Ministry of Finance, together with the uh, lead ministries for the sector working groups, an overall results framework for development cooperation. We, we based it on what they had in Mozambique, which was for budget support, but we did it without budget support. And we based it on the government's, government's own plans. And, and uh, all the sector working groups uh, reported results in relation to those results frameworks. And we could have dialogue led by the, the, uh, by the prime minister at that time. And, and ambassadors participated, development heads, heads of development cooperation participated, and there was preparations in the sector working group for which dialogue should we bring up, which results have been achieved, which have not been received. And we could have high, high level dialogue based on development cooperation, looking at uh, the, the bottlenecks for those results and for, uh, that hindered those results to happen, that it did not happen and we could bring it up. And it was very exciting. And I still see that. And I see that TEIs can very well fit into that to also uh, complement an overall dialogue. That is if you can build up this dialogue and, and get donors engaged for it. One step for EU might be through the TEIs, but also EU has budget support. <laughs> Uh, in many countries, and we can see what one can do with that. And let's see what can happen from this mapping. But it has to be together with government uh, uh, leadership, drivers of change in government. And I think we are more likely to find them in the sector working groups and, and build on uh, their, their push for change and uh, concrete results that will happen in people's lives. Uh, thank you, Annika. We are we have time for um, a, a round of, of questions to all panelists, and that I think is.
the EU uh, when Sweden assumes the EU presidency in a few um, in a few months' time. Um, and what what do you think um, uh, Sweden should use? How Sweden could use that platform to further enhance uh, in country collaboration. Um, and we start with you, Alexei, and I would like you to also at the same time very quickly address a, a, a question from from the from the audience. If you just could say in uh, in one line what what the EU Global Gateway is, um, so that uh, for for everyone's benefit. And and if you then could could move on to the presidency, um, Alexei. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, the EU Global Gateway is is yet another another branding, <coughs> um, whereby the the EU uh, is communicating on its support to uh, infrastructure and connectivity around the world. Uh, and some say that this this essentially a response to the Belt and Road Initiative uh, of China, uh, and and to show how the EU is also engaging in these areas uh, to support partner countries in, in digitalization in in more infrastructure uh, building and the whole point is uh, raising uh, investments or leveraging investments uh, up to 300 billion uh, euros up until 2027 that's what the eu promised to the world through this global gateway so i think the good thing is indeed there's nothing really new when you look at it uh, for the moment but at least it 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 tells a good story. I think it brings together what the EU is already planning with its own instrument and programming and linking that again to some of the key priorities, uh, namely on climate, green, digital, um, etc. And um, I think that's that's quite a welcome step for the EU to communicate better on how it is supporting partner countries in, in these areas. The key point uh, is how to raise these 300 billion, uh, 150 just for, for, for Africa alone. Um, and I, I think for that, the role of the member states and their banks and DFIs will be, will be crucial. Alexei, I think you need to move on to the presidency issue. Yeah. So the presidency, I think, you know, clearly for, for all the issues we referred to this morning, um, Sweden has a, has a key, I think, a key role to play to, for instance, put back uh, the issue of, of country ownership uh, on the table. And uh, in the coming, uh, coming months and a couple of years, uh, there will be uh, opportunities for the EU to uh, undertake a midterm review for instance, of uh, the programming and uh, what it has been doing so far with its instruments. And I think in that context, it would be particularly important to re-emphasize the importance of country ownership in the process leading to this midterm review, in the implementation as well of Team Europe initiatives. So that's, I think, one concrete example. Another one, I think, uh, is also we referred a lot to um, knowledge exchange and good practices. Uh, some member states like Sweden and the collaboration between the ministry and CEDA or with uh, other member states, their collaboration with their private sector and DFIs. I think there's a lot, there's a wealth of exp expertise uh, and experiences that, that ought to be shared more broadly. And perhaps the, the Swedish presidency could also be a platform, at least a, um, a moment to, to encourage such uh, exchanges. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, collaboration with the development agencies, uh, development finance institutions. I think there's a lot of um, wealth out there that would deserve you know, some exchange and, and some kind of uh, uh, capitalization. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, Robert, your perspective in a minute. In uh, one minute. Sweden is a, a powerful advocacy actor uh, and, and I think Sweden can certainly use the EU presidency to, to, to set example, perhaps working together in, in the like-minded group with, with other EU member states and, and also talk around a lot in Brussels, set a couple of good examples that are possible to follow up, but also request to the EU Commission itself that they fully champion on the Team Europe approach because they, 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 they also work in silos and might need a little push to dare to say that we we don't do this only as the EU Commission. We do it fully backed by the EU member states in the Team Europe approach. This gives us self-confidence that we need. Um, thank you, Robert. And Eric, your final punchline when it comes to um, what Sweden could prioritize during the presidency. Yeah, it's not funny, though. It's serious business. Uh, 
I mean, I think Sweden has been a, an effectiveness advocate uh, for decades. Uh, and my, my recommendation would pick up on where I concluded in the presentation that there's certain building blocks for more effective collaboration that have been recognized for a long time um, that relate to the harmonization of um, practices among member states and between member states and the, um, the EU institutions that should have greater focus. So I think um, in this uh, presidency, uh, apart from the headline champion championing um, uh, a stronger collective approach, uh, Sweden can focus attention on questions of synchronization, harmonization in areas like procurement contracting um, that would enable the EU and member states to work more effectively together uh, on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eric. Um, Annika, your perspective on, on this particular topic? Uh, yes, I think we have an enormously important opportunity here with Sweden becoming the, the chair of, of, of the EU. Um, we, my experience from all the countries that I worked with and worked in is that the voice uh, from Sweden, they like to listen to the voice from Sweden. So we, we really, uh, and it's because we have tried to have constructive, pragmatic dialogue. So I think if we can help EU with all the important values that EU stand for and with the human rights as a basis, if, if we can have constructive dialogue around um, human rights, uh, I think that's what the world needs right now. And that's uh, that's what is needed in Africa, which I know most about. But I also have worked a little bit in Eastern Europe and, and I really saw that uh, a thorough uh, understanding dialogue on human rights where we also challenge. Um, so, and continue to work on country ownership, um, enabling government institutions to bring about the need, you know, that is um, the goal is 17 in, uh, in Agenda 2030 on enabling gov enable government institutions to be more accountable and transparent, aid effectiveness and uh, democratic culture uh, as as well as peace and inclusive growth. And of course, we have to talk about environment and climate change. The list was fairly long, uh, but I'll stop there. Thank you, um, uh, Annika. Uh, Ahmed, um, you will be the last to uh, say something about the presidency. But before you do that, I will sneak in another question, um, uh, which was uh, on... Um, Geopolitics and, and national security are not normally themes in Swedish development cooperation. Picking up on what Alex say, said about the great, the grander geopolitical sphere, do you think that um, this will be more important in upcoming country strategies? Can you say that in one minute and then one minute on, on the presidency? Well, I'll try to sort of combine the, the two questions, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, Magnus. I, I think that the geopolitical dimension of Team Europe perhaps involves a, a, a bit of, of uh, uh, new uh, aspects compared to, to um, what, what we as an EU collective, but also Sweden nationally has focused on, on previously. But, but I think nonetheless that it will, will probably will, will, um, be, be a, a large emphasis on what has already been touched upon uh, sort of bringing uh, more of a whole holistic approach to to bringing development to our partner countries that is the backbone of of what global gateway strategy um is, is trying to to achieve and i think also when reading our new government's uh, approach uh, and and seeing how how it will will inf uh, influence our national uh, development uh, cooperation i think sort of br bringing more synergies uh to the table, uh, being an eff effective delivery will will be important. I think that that inf inf and is influencing how sort of um, we will 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 tackle uh, the the the. 
the geopolitical aspects of, of development cooperation, so to say. But I think also we, we can't sort of forget that sort of collectively uh, the EU and its member states are the biggest uh, provider of development assistance in the world. And as also uh, um, uh, was mentioned earlier, that we are uh, all, we, we bring a lot of firepower to the table uh, in terms of being the largest economy and trading partner of the world. And I think you know we we need to 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 see all the different strands. Uh, of, of what we're doing to make sure that we're bringing effective impact and delivery to our partner countries' needs. Because I think uh, if we focus too narrowly on, on uh, in, uh, or being uh, having it as a silo, uh, then, then we will not uh, achieve what we aim to do. And it, and it will be, be also uh, uh, something that, that our partner countries will, will, will judge us uh, uh, against as well. And I think there, therefore, in terms of pr the presidency, what we will try to, to 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 really do is to maintain momentum for for the work that is uh, the, that is uh, we're doing ahead. So bolstering the effective implementation of TIs, for example, and impact of global Europe as an instrument will be ex extremely important for us. Uh, Thank you. Not least in t in review for the, the midterm review. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, uh, I think. We can conclude with that there are many issues and there was a lot of energy among the audience and we have many unanswered questions uh, but this webinar is now coming to a close um, i would like to thank you all uh, for listening and contributing to an interesting discussion uh, a, polit a particular thank you of course to you eric for presenting the report and to ahmed annika robert and alexei for sharing your insights um, I would like to encourage everyone to visit our website, www.eba.se, where you can download reports, subscribe to our newsletters, listen to our podcast and sign up for uh, more interesting uh, seminars. The next seminar will actually take place on the 25th November and discuss various aspects regarding the war on Ukraine, including reconstruction and the migration crisis. This seminar is now coming to a close and uh, I thank you all for listening. Bye for now.